that was a beautiful song and um usually i um am you know like sometimes people ask you know before i would come and speak if there's a uh, song or anything like that and um so i didn't really choose any songs but i know that the holy spirit did because what we're going to talk about now is about jesus we're going to talk about um basically what happened in those song lyrics it's such a beautiful song um tell how what 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 uh hymn number was that again 534 tell the story of jesus tell of the cross where they nailed him writhing in anguish and pain love in that story so tender clearer than ever i see and so what we're going to talk about is his grace now, the power of his grace, and um, how the grace of God, how it is sufficient for us, and how it is that grace of God where we can find power over sin, over every temptation. And even when we don't want to follow God, we can ask for more grace. And by the power of that grace, we would be drawn to our good Savior. And so... I'll be honest with you, church. I'm only sharing what I've been studying when I wake up in the morning and I just spend time with Jesus. I just wake up and I go out to, I praise God for Weimar because it's a place of nature. Uh, it's it's in, in positioned in a, like in the boonies, like middle, like right off the freeway, you got to know where Weimar is to, you know, you can't just stumble across it unless the Lord leads you there in Providence. But um, so, so I wake up in the morning um, before the sun rises, if, if um, I sleep early enough the night before, and um, I go out to the farm, and I just start looking at the trees, and I start looking at watching the sun rise, and just start admiring God's handiwork, and I start um, just meditating on if God can build, can speak all of this into existence, then he could definitely take care of my problems. And so, church, I'm not really preaching to you. I mean, that's what you can call it. But I'm just, I'm just talking, church. Can I talk to you? Yes. Amen. So I'm just, I'm just talking, and I'm not the greatest orator or anything like that. Yeah, I know some big words here and there. But what I really want you to focus on, and what I'm going to be focusing on, is not my preaching. We're going to be focusing on this story of Jesus. We're going to be looking at his grace, his power, and um, we're going to see how it's sufficient for us, how it's enough for us to the point where we, like Paul, can say that in our infirmities, in our necessities, in our reproaches, our distresses and our persecutions for Christ's sake, we can be strong in those things by God's grace. Amen? Amen. So as the first session was, we looked at the power of God's word. Now we're going to look at the power of God's grace but really, all of it is about trusting in God and about the story of Jesus Christ. If anything, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, we can see in the Bible how faith upon God's word is exercised all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And, it's, and the result of trusting in the word of God, expecting the word of God to yield results, and depending upon the word of God for those results, we see that the only result is salvation and the working out of God's purposes and so we want to trust in God's word and now as we prepare to look at the power of God's grace I'd invite you to kneel if you're able uh, to pray with me as we enter to this Bible study time Heavenly Father Lord we thank you in Jesus name for your Bible we thank you Father for your grace which your Bible says is sufficient for us and so Father we're asking you to teach us from your Bible how it is sufficient, and I pray that when we leave from this place, you would give us an experience in seeing that truly your grace is sufficient for us. Father, put your words in my mouth, and Father, please, if anyone is struggling with sin, Lord, free them today. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to start. So like the last one, we went through a lot of verses, right? But this, but... But the main things, if you want to study on your own, the power of God's word, just study Genesis 22 and look at how Abraham 
was relying on God's word. And you could just read, Gen Genesis is an easy book to read, I, I would say, personally, I think so. So you can just start from Genesis wherever um, Abraham left Ur, and then just keep reading and reading, and you'll see all these times where God gives word, his word, and Abraham either reacts upon the word with trust or distrust, and you can see what happens. And then you can just take God at his word, and you can either trust or not trust him, and you'll see what happens with that. Um, so Genesis 22, Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 and 8, you can even see in uh, Matthew 8, the beginning, the leper, um, he says, I believe that, that you can make me clean. And then Jesus says, I will be thou clean. He speaks, he touches him, speaks, and the leprosy leaves. So we continue to see the power of God's word. And so Matthew 8 and Genesis 22 for the last segment. Now for this one, the focuses are going to be John chapter 15. John chapter 15 verses 4 and 5. The whole chapter is awesome, but uh, there's so much even in just John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. And 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10, you should have already known that we were going to go there if we're talking about God's grace being sufficient. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 to 10. And uh, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, I have here verses 6 through 18. But I would invite you to, you know, study that whole chapter for yourself uh, just because it's a beautiful thing. So John chapter 15, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and Hebrews 2 is going to be the main focus of this second segment. And I'm pulling out my phone here because I actually have um, some content here that I want to share as well and that's in line with all of this. And the reason it's on my phone is because this is something that I was just sharing with my classmates for a presentation. And so it's awesome how God's Word, you can share it in your classroom, at your workplace, with a church when you're preaching. You know, God's Word is God's Word. It's not to be restricted to only one setting. Amen? Okay, so I titled my little presentation on this called A Life of Power. And so... By focusing on God's grace, we can have a life of power. So we already prayed. Uh, John chapter 15. I was in Luke. John chapter 15, starting at verse 5. Let's read here. It says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. And so earlier I was talking about how I go out to the farm that's on campus, and I look at the, you know, all the trees, these towering 60-foot tall pine trees weighing thousands of pounds and stuff like that, and the leaves of these trees and other trees as well, and how as, this is awesome right here, because when Jesus is speaking, this is not only his command or his statement, but it's an invitation. And so as closely connected as these flowers, uh, well, they're not connected to their source anymore, but anything that's a plant that's alive, as, when it's connected to its source, as close as that connection is, that is the connection that we, how close it is that we can have with Jesus. Amen? And it's in that connection that we're going to have this life of power. And uh, it's in that connection where we get to see his grace. And so, so I just want to share some statements from the ministry of healing. The Savior's life on earth was a life of communion with nature and with God. In this communion, he revealed for us the secret of a life of power. So it's in the communion with God that the life of power is revealed. The Savior found it necessary to seek retirement and unbroken communion with his Father. If Jesus, who lived a sinless life, found it necessary to go and seek retirement, to seek, he sought it out to seek retirement and unbroken communion with his Father. If Jesus had to do it, do you think that we have to do it too, church? Yeah. Amen. If we would have this life of power. So, all who are under the training of God, and if you believe you're under the training of God, say amen. amen. All who are under the training of God need the quiet hour for communion 
with their own hearts, with nature, and with God. It doesn't just say with their own hearts and with God. The Spirit of Prophecy here mentions the word nature as well. If you have a front or a backyard and you have trees and things with leaves and flowers on them, go outside in the morning and look at them and ponder how a Creator God could make something that smells so good, looks so good, and if it's a fruit, tastes so good. And you will just say God is good. So the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46.10. This is taken from Ministry of Healing, page 58. Uh, everything I just shared. And so, we need that communion time with God. We need that devotional life with God. And if we don't have that time of communion with God, then we're not going to have uh, a good relationship with Him. It's not going to work out. And um, if we're talking, now we're, ta we're talking about relationships, right? And you know what happens when two people break up, right? They say, it's just not going to work out. It's, it's, they can say, it's, it's, uh, it's me, it's not you, and stuff like that. But when it comes to a relationship with Jesus Christ, the only reason it would not, it would not work out is not him, it, it, it's not, it's us. Yeah, exactly. So if we're failing to have, this uh, abiding relationship with God, then we won't be able to have one in the first place. And so let's look back at the scripture here. John chapter 15, verse 4, Jesus says, abide in me. And so in the Strong's Concordance, the word abide means to stay with, to be present with, to dwell with. And so the question is, how can we dwell with someone, how can we remain with someone? How can we be present with someone who we cannot physically see or touch, right? And I know there's a lot of answers probably welling up in your hearts, and praise the Lord for that. But that is the question. So how can we dwell with someone we cannot see or touch? And the answer that I uh, would suggest this morning is simply by faith. Simply believing is how we can remain and dwell and abide with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, right? And so earlier, just a few minutes ago, that's what we just talked about. We talked about the Word of God and, um, and God's, uh, God's power in His Word. Um, let me just say one more quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you would guide my mind in your Word, Lord, I seek not to be distracted by anything. Father, I just want to present what you have shared to me. Father, that we would all receive a corporate blessing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so simply by believing that Jesus is with us, we can have that abiding presence with him. And the only way that we can believe that God is with us is if we first read about it, right? When he says that I will never leave you nor fail you, I will be with you always even into the end of the world. And so, now we're talking about having a relationship with God and abiding with Him. Now there's two types of relationship. Maybe there's more, but at least the two that I'm going to talk about right now is having an abiding relationship versus a long-distance relationship. And so now, we can think about the, the, in the world, um, in, in like human physical form, if we have a long-distance relationship, just for example, let's say, someone has a significant other, and the significant other lives very far across the ocean or across many state lines or wherever they are, hours away, but they just don't see each other on a daily basis or on a monthly basis or however uh, long periods of time, you, they will wake up in the morning, they will call their significant other, they will say, good morning, I love you, so forth and so on, I, you know, miss you, blah, blah, blah. And then they hang up the phone, and what happens when they, uh, when they leave their room? They're, you know, they're still in a relationship, but you can't really tell. You can't really tell this person's in a relationship because when they're walking down the street, there's no one on their arm. You know, when they're going and sitting down at dinner time, there's no one sitting across from them. When they're um, doing things, they're doing it by themselves, and that's what happens in a long-distance relationship. Yeah, they talk about, I love you. They talk about, I can't wait to see you, and all these things. But then throughout the day, you notice and you'll see that 
they're riding solo, you know? And so when they're going in there, oh, I like that in the store, they go and get it. There's no other input. You see, if, uh, if um, take for example, my, my mom and my dad. If my, mom, if my dad was at Home Depot and he was saying, wow, these curtains look nice, my mom might say something. And then there would be able to be a, 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 a discourse or a, a dialogue to where something that satisfy, satisfies both of them will be purchased. Or they go to dinner, and um, let's say they're doing um, family style, oh, and like they're both going to share each other's food. My dad could say, oh, I want to order this. And then my mom's like, but I'm not going to eat any of that. And then, but, and then my mom can say, hey, I, wanna, I, wanna buy, I want some of these. And my dad's like, hmm, okay, I like that. So then they both get something that they both like. There was input on that. Everyone's happy, and you know, they, they're enjoying that experience, that relationship. And so that's the difference between an abiding relationship with God and a long-distance relationship. For us, as Christians who have devotional lives, and this is for the Christians that do have devotional lives, sometimes our relationship with God in our devotional life or in our lives in general is a long-distance relationship. We wake up in the morning. We wake up hours before the sun rises. And the first thing we do is not eat our breakfast with physical food, but we make sure that we're opening our Bibles and studying God's Word. However, we do these things, and then when our devotional time is up, when that 30-minute timer, when that two-hour timer rings, or we check our phones, oh, it's two, oh, the sun's finally up, we leave that time of devotion, and as the Bible says, we straightway forget what manner of man we were, or we straightway forget that Jesus was actually trying to spend the whole day with us, and we've only opened the door, said hello to Jesus, closed the door, and went about our business. And so it's very dangerous for us to have a long-distance relationship because if we're only having a long-distance relationship with Jesus, with God, then when the times get tough, we're not going to be calling on Him. Just like if, uh, if uh, uh, someone was to call on the, the closest person in an emergency um, in an abiding relationship is the person next to them. That person can, you know, take care of them. But then in a long-distance relationship, that person is nowhere to be found. And then we see that the person who says they have a relationship with someone, but they're all the way over there, they end up calling out other sources to save them. And, you know, it's not bad to call the police to save you or anything, but if you're understanding what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that when we start getting hungry, when we start losing our jobs, when we start facing trials, and we have a long-distance relationship, we're going to turn to other things instead of God to satisfy that need, that desire, that thing that we're suffering with. And then that's when, that's when we lose out. That's when we make a mistake. And so in talking about a long-distance relationship, versus an abiding relationship. What we need is that abiding relationship. We need Jesus at our side. There's a book called Prayer by Ella White. I remember one of my, uh, my colleagues shared this statement. It said that prayer brings Jesus to our side. And so if we want power over sin, we must have an abiding relationship with Jesus. He must be our companion. And by faith only, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, is how we can abide with, dwell with Christ by faith only. And so if we will have a fruitful, productive Christian walk, we ought to abide with Christ. And not just spend time with Him in the morning, but make sure He's at every part of our day, even when we're walking down the street. Oh Lord, uh, that TV looks nice. It would, look, it would fill up most of the uh, wall in my uh, room and I would be able to watch all these great sermons on it. But Jesus might say, no, no. That's too much. You, you don't need that. Or, you know, every, any other thing. Amen? Okay. So now let's go to the meat right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. I really love what we're about to get into. And I pray that you will love it too, because it's about Jesus. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. The Bible reads here, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, 
for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, Paul says, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So Jesus says, my grace is sufficient. And um, so why is it sufficient, right? Why is Jesus' grace sufficient, you know? We, we, we can talk about the cross, like that's what makes it sufficient. That's what adds value to that statement, my grace is sufficient. We can look at the story of sal- uh, the plan of salvation all the way from, from Genesis and um, see how faith and r- the righteousness which is by faith, is demonstrated all from the beginning at Genesis where Abraham was, you know, um, abiding by God's word, living by God's word, and then he was having experiences with God's word. God's word. We can look at it all the way from Genesis to the cross, and then from the cross to Revelation, and then back to the cross. And what I'm trying to say is that we can look at the entire Bible and we can study the entire Bible and we can look and be blessed by it and we can realize that it's the content in the Bible, the amazing truths that are in the Bible that makes God's grace sufficient. But what I want to focus on right now is um, our identity. And so I like to call this part um, the identity crisis, right? So the young people of my age today I'm about 22 years old, and you can, you know, give or take 10 years in either direction. A lot of people are, and even some, maybe uh, anyone from any other generation, could be struggling with their identity, wondering uh, what makes me me, what makes me valuable. And so a lot of young people will go to the world, will go to drugs and alcohol, and uh, adulterous lifestyle, and... Um, seeking the, the, the glory of the world as their identity, right? And then we've even heard before, uh, we may have all heard that all of us are the sons of God and the sons and daughters of God. And I've even heard someone say a um, few years ago, several years ago, that um, not everyone is a son of God. And so I kind of thought about that because the Bible does say in Romans that not all of us, it, it says that some are the children of uh, Belial or wickedness, and some are the children of God. But there's a context in to, as to why Paul says that. And first we're going to talk about why I believe that the Bible tells us is, um, or not what I believe, but the Bible tells us that all of us are the brethren of Jesus Christ. That all of us are the sons of God. And we're going to look at that in um, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, in looking at the power of God's grace, what gives that grace sufficient power? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. I love this. It says, Behold. And so God is calling us to look upon, to behold, to really see what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And I'll add the the sons and daughters of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. And so God is calling us uh, to behold, or the, the writer here, John, is saying, look, look at this manner of love that God would call us his children, his sons. Right? And so the question is, okay, so I'm a son of God. We've heard that from our, chi- from our childhood up, if, if we've been Christians. As long as we've been Christians, it's probably been told us time and time again, you're a son of God, you're a daughter of God, you're a child of God, right? But how deep does this connection actually, <clears throat> actually go? Where is the weight in this statement? So that brings us to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 starting at verse 6. And uh, there's more questions in this uh, Hebrews right here, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 6. When you're there, please say amen. 
Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 6, we're looking at the power of God's grace. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with the glory and honor, uh, with glory and honor, and did set him over the work of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all, for in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But we now see, we now we see, yet all thing. Oh, sorry. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So, so far, uh, we are met with the question, so what is man that thou art mindful of him? How valuable is man that you're even going to, talking to God, even think about us? And how far deep does this connection go? And now let's look at verse 9. We're talking about the story of Jesus now. What, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. And look at verse 7. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. So verse 9, he made little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for a couple men, for every man. And so, just in here alone, we can see how the Bible is illustrating how deep this connection is with Jesus Christ. How we we're made a little lower than the angels. Now, we're probably way below the angels because of how far we've been degraded by sin. But still yet, Jesus took on the seed of Abraham. And we're going to get to that. And so, there's parallel language in verse 7 and 9. But then you'll notice that in Jesus' description, it says, made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. And so we see that Jesus was not only, uh, the Bible is not only illustrating the connection, but also illustrating how the connection was made by the suffering of death, being one of us and then being, uh, being made human and then suffering the death uh, of the cross, that he should die for every man, taste death for every man, that we would not have to taste of that second death. And so, verse 9 is not just talking about uh, a superficial death or just dying and then coming back. If you study the Bible, you'll find out that Jesus actually died, and, and uh, Spirit of Prophecy, he died the second death. Yes, he died a death that had separated him from the presence of God. And he had to trust in God, Psalm chapter 16 and verse 10, that thou wouldest not keep my soul in hell, but would, not, uh, uh, but would deliver me. You know, and then if you uh, look in uh, Revelation chapter 1, I am he that liveth, uh, and liveth forevermore, was dead and liveth, and have the keys to death in Hades. The Greek translations of that is talking about the grave, talking about the end death. And so Jesus actually came back. He came back from the second death. He came back from, from hell, basically. And so, praise the Lord. We didn't have to do that. We couldn't do that, but Jesus did it. And he did it not only as God, but as one of us, to show us how much power we can have by accepting God's word, God's grace in our life. Okay, so let's look at verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. So this is the creator in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. It didn't say for it became him for, more, for whom are all things and by whom are all things is perfect and bringing many sons unto glory make the captain. It, it says the word perfect after it says, um, or uh, it says the word perfect in regards to suffering. That Jesus, in order to be a perfect captain of our salvation, he couldn't just do it arbitrarily. He couldn't just do it from a distance. He had to get down in the trenches with sinful humanity, experience our feelings, experience our pain, experience the turmoil we experience. And by experiencing that, he became our perfect captain of our salvation. So, 
Verse 11, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And so, there's God the Father, and there's Jesus the brother. And um, Ellen White also calls Jesus Father, but then she also calls him brother in Steps of Christ. And so, for me, I'm like wondering, like, do I call Jesus my father? And we could talk about this afterwards. But it's so amazing to know that we have a heavenly brother as well. That we have someone who we can relate to on a sibling level of connection. Who we can relate to that um, um, he shares, you know. So my, the connection I have with my dad is a really, really good connection, right? And so, but... Let's be honest here. Who, who has siblings here? Who has siblings? Right? Okay, so there's things that you would go behind doors in your bedroom with your sibling and you just talk about things to your sibling that you probably didn't tell mom and dad, right? Um, or maybe you did, and that's good. But I can tell you that there's things me and my brother talked about that I didn't really talk to my parents about. And so when the Bible is telling us that Jesus, uh, that Jesus is not ashamed to call his brethren, that he's not ashamed to be one of us, it's so awesome because it drives even closer the connection that we have uh, that Jesus has established between us. And so what we're talking about right now is the power of God's grace and how this grace is not some arbitrary power that's far removed, but we can actually have access to that grace and how we can be, uh, receive power from a meditation by looking and, and uh, believing on this grace. So this is what Jesus said. In verse 12, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again will I put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. And so, so far we see that Jesus is so into us that he is talking to us about God. And he's putting his trust in God. And he's putting us in his trust for God. Okay. Verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So, as much as we are flesh and bone, as real as this will bleed if it, if it gets cut, Jesus took on the same form, not to just show I'm God, I can become flesh, I can become all-powerful, uh, uh, I mean, I can become flesh and then live a sinless life and then die and then go to heaven. He didn't do that just to show us that, but he did it so that we can really have someone we relate to in this struggle, in this battle with sin. And not just someone we can relate to, but someone we can turn to to have utter victory over sin. So, and then verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And this morning I paid particular attention to this verse to try and figure out what they're talking about in bondage. And I, you can study the Bible for a very long time and still get to learn more. But just for now, very simply, um, when without a Savior, it's hopeless. Without a Savior, we're in bondage. Without a Savior, we're, we're, we're stuck to sin the same way a fly might be caught in a web and so um and the reason i mentioned that fly in the web um i mention it right now so i was uh walking back to my dorm room uh yesterday i think it was either friday or thursday and what i saw in the corner of my eye i didn't hear, see it first i heard it i heard this loud buzzing a super loud buzzing and i go and i look and it's this fly that's flapping its wings as hard as it can, making like a very uh, weed whacker type of noise, uh, but it can't go anywhere, and I go and I look, and there's this ugly spider, big one, not even a black widow, uglier than that. Um, it's just there holding on to this fly. It's caught in its web. This fly was at the end of its line. It truly was going to perish. It truly was going to die. It wasn't going to make it out of that. I could see exerting all of 100% of its energy how it was trying to get out, but it couldn't. And so that's our situation 
in sin. We literally have no, and, and, and I'm not speaking unbiblically, and you'll see where I'm coming from. We literally, without a Savior, an intercessor, have no chance of escaping from sin. We will die in our sins. But Jesus, the Bible says that what he did was to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Jesus came, took on our form, not to just share this form, but we just talked about that, to deliver us as well. And so we have a human intercessor in the form of Jesus Christ who is actually making intercession for us at the right hand of God. And so someone actually comes and takes us out of that web. On our own, we can't. But what Jesus did is he literally plucked us out. And look how easy it is for a human to go and smash a spider and take a fly out of the web, which I've done that before in the past. I kind of felt bad because the spider couldn't eat. But um, the analogy, the analogy of when we're stuck in sin, we're totally stuck there and we're going to perish there. But the Bible here is telling us how Jesus stooped so low that he would suffer the death of the second death, total separation from God, that he did that so that we could just have a chance because he's not forcing us because he loves us. Amen. And so he gives us that choice if we want to be saved or not. He doesn't, he doesn't just uh, say, I saved you, now you have to listen to me, or I'm going to strike you with lightning. That's not God's posture towards us. That's not Christ's posture towards us. His posture is, I love you so much, I died for you, and even if you continue to trample upon my character, which is his law, even if you continue to spit on me and hate me, I still do it. And that's what he did, amen? amen. So that's who Jesus is, and we're just talking about Jesus. Okay. Verse 16, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And so now we're talking about, earlier we talked about how um, we're probably way lower than the angels now. And because of our uh, degraded genetics and the, the, what sin has done to our bodies throughout the thousands of years we've been on this earth. And so Jesus is not, did not come to earth with, a, uh, um, with like an advantage. Right? He, he, he is the Son of God, but he didn't come to earth with like, okay, I'm going to be able to avoid this temptation, uh, but these ones, I'm, I know I can get through them. No, it wasn't like that. It was more like a baby born in the world, and the baby was subject to all temptations, and the baby grew up, and the baby, uh, not the baby, but now the child and the man, you know, just like everyone else endured. So you see, I'm talking about the life of Christ. The life that Christ lived was as human as the life that we live here on this earth. And if Christ had victory, then we can have victory too, amen? amen? And so because Jesus became a human just like us, took on our broken, sinful human form, Christ was not a sinner. When I say sinful, I'm talking about the propensity or the, 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 the um, you know, the temptation, the subject to temptation. Jesus was born with the ability to be subjected to temptation just like we are. So in verse 17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. And when I first saw that word behooved, I didn't Google it. And so I thought the word behooved was like surprised, right? So I thought it, that it meant that wherefore in all things it surprised him to be made like unto his brethren. But that doesn't mean uh, surprised. Behooved actually means obligated so i'm just going to read here from my notes uh in verse i'll just read all of verse 17 then i'll go to this wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to god to make reconciliation for the sins of the people now we're going to focus on three things in this verse the word brethren the word people and the word behooved right so Brethren, it's a familial term. It's a term of closeness. It's a term of endearment, right? So Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren. We saw that in verse 11. And then we're looking at verse 17, which is talking about the people. At the end of that verse, I looked up the word people in the concordance, and the word people there, it says the people in general. So it's not talking about a specific people group, right? And so when Jesus is here on the cross making reconciliation, He's making reconciliation for all people, which includes all people 
in that brethren statement that he's that's also being mentioned. And so when someone tells me that someone is not a child of God, that's not Bible. But when the Bible is saying that um, not all people are the uh, son of God, it's the con uh, what what it's talking about. The context is that we have been given the sonship, the identity of children of God, but some of us make decisions where we are placed under a different banner. And so we are children of God, but we, God said that. God calls us his children, but we call ourselves children of the world. And that's the only way we can lose our sonship and be lost in our sins is if we believe the lie that my identity is found in somewhere else instead of in Jesus Christ. And so if we find our identity in Jesus, that's when sin we see it as that sand castle. Before it was a stronghold which we could not conquer, but when sin is the sand castle, or, or, or when we are sons of God, we naturally have the impulses of God as well. Me, I struggled with uh, marijuana before, I'll just say that. But for, for that drug, I don't do that no more. Not because, oh, it's the right thing, I'm trying to stay away from that. Like, you know, trying to do all the forms and try and be holy. I don't do that because I'm a son of God. And so Jesus gave all of us here sonship, gave all of us here the adoption of sons, as it says in Romans, so that we could recognize that sin is powerless, that at the cross where Jesus died for us, he is that, that's where that kingdom of grace was fully established, that that's where sin was utterly broken, and that if we are weak and we keep falling, we go back to that cross and we see that sin is actually broken and that a Savior liveth and maketh intercession for us and has given us the ultimate victory already. And so we just take that victory and we walk in it by faith. And what's that called? Righteousness by, by faith. So we no longer have to look at, oh, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Are you a son of God? Amen. And so... Just look at the Bible and you'll see how easy it is to now do the right thing. So, wherefore in all things it behooved him. We didn't talk about that, so I'll just read what I wrote here. This establishes us as Jesus' brethren. He took upon himself the legal obligation of Savior because the transgressed law required a life. And it was Jesus' life that, was, uh, that he uh, offered for that. The obligation, the legal obligation of Savior to be the lamb which takes away the sins of the world. He did it not as God only. This is amazing right here. He did it not as God only, but both as God and as man. Hence, the son of man. Thus, you'll see it in Steps of Christ as well, elevating humanity. So we are not stuck in this pit of sin. We have been elevated. Christ did not stoop low to be like, oh, pick my arm up and I'll pull you out of sin. No, as he was falling, he picked us up and raised us up. And he elevated humanity in that way. There is no other created beings in this universe that are closer to, um, that have had the honor of sharing their creator, created form with their creator. But Jesus has stooped so low as to take on our form to make humanity one of the most, as it was supposed to be, the highest forms of creation in this universe. And so when we destroy ourselves with sin, when we are already established as the sons of God and we destroy ourselves with sin, we're just listening to a lie from the devil that, oh, you're not a son, and take this. This, this will give you your identity. This will give you your, um, your, your satisfaction. And then we start hurting ourselves and we start incurring upon ourselves uh, uh, diseases and eventually death because we believed in a lie. All the, devil, the, the Bible says the devil from the beginning is a liar and a murderer. And so because he's a liar, that means what he's saying has no weight in it. And so I'm continuing to drive this point home that when the devil tells you, oh, do this thing that makes you feel so good, he's lying to you. And actually that has no power to give you whatever you're desiring, happiness or whatever. It's actually Jesus who had given us that. But it takes faith, brethren, and it takes an experience. 
Okay, and now I want to look at verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. And verse uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. But before that, so he's able to secure them that are tempted. Being then that he was tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. And so Jesus experienced the victory as a human being. He experienced temptation as a human being. And so he can relate. A lot of people look for identities because they don't find anyone they can relate with. But Jesus himself says, I relate with you. So we're looking at Hebrews chapter 4. And we're going to look at uh, verses 14 through 16. And then um, we're going to wrap it up here. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. When you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, our brother, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace and find uh, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So let's go back to 2 Corinthians now and let's read that given this new uh, inspiration. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. And he said unto me, or verse 9 and 10, And he said unto me, Jesus said unto Paul here, and says to us, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so the prayer is, Father God, I am weak, and I keep falling to this particular, to, to sin, whatever sin it may be. But then I look at Jesus on his cross, suffering for my sins, and we find strength, not in ourselves to overcome, but we just look at the cross and we find that strength in Jesus Christ. Amen? So let me just read this uh, statement here that I wrote down. Okay, now we abide with Christ. What is it about Christ that will give us power? We just talked about His grace. So in 2 Corinthians 9, or 12, 9, and 10, Jesus teaches us that His grace is enough. It's adequate. So in our weakness, it is the grace of God if we would let Him give it to us, because we still have to make that choice uh, of recognizing our sonship that shows us the mighty works of Christ working in our lives both to will and to do of His good pleasure. We are weak, and sometimes we stumble, but if we would meditate... Biblical meditation talking about taking the themes that we're talking about now and really think about it in your own personal time If we would meditate on the magnificent love encased in the gift of God's grace That grace being fully illustrated at that cross on Calvary We would find strength to resist temptation Strength to resist evil and to resist sin We would find this strength not in ourselves but in Jesus Christ and so the righteousness which is of God by faith is the righteousness that we do not obtain by trying to keep this. Now, listen to me when I'm talking here. It's not the righteousness that we have in trying to keep the Sabbath, in making sure we're not angry with our brother, in making sure that we go to church on the right times, and making sure that we wake up in the morning and have devotional. That's not, uh, that, that, that is not in and of itself the righteousness which is of God by faith. The righteousness which is of God by faith is looking at Jesus, seeing the law that we spurned, asking for, for seeing that eternal death is our portion, but looking at that cross and seeing that, it, that death was taken and crucified on that cross, realizing that the power of sin was actually broken, looking at Jesus falling at his feet, being justified, and thanking our Savior by keeping the Sabbath. Thanking our Savior by waking up in the, mo in the morning time to spend time with Him. Thanking our Savior by getting rid of sin because sin is a defeated foe and we are actually the sons of God now. And so I want to just uh, look at, uh, we're here in 2 Corinthians, look at chapter 5. And um, we're going to wrap up, here. I know I said that we're going to wrap up earlier, but God's word is just so good. And I think I have a little more time. But um, 
So we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, looking at verse 17 and verse 20, uh, through verse 21. And then I'm going to read a statement from Steps to Christ, and then, and then we'll finish there. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. When you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. They're dead. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus says, I forgive you. To wit, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And then I'll just go to verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And so, instead of giving us the just reward of our sin, which is death, God gave us Jesus instead. A man who knew no sin, that by his life and his death, we might, because we can still say no, but he had given us this gift, so why reject it? That we might be made the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. And so if you're struggling to overcome something, you can look at Jesus today. Steps to Christ says in page 70, paragraph 1, You are to give all, and you must take all. Christ, the fullness of all blessing, to abide in your heart, to be your strength, your righteousness, your everlasting helper, to give you power to obey. And if you missed Jesus in that, I rewrote the same quote with a little bit more of the word Christ in there. It says, You are to give all, and you must take all. Christ, who is the fullness of all blessing, is to abide in your heart. Christ is to be your strength. Christ's righteousness is your righteousness. Christ is your everlasting helper. And when, it's, when, it, when we get down to it, Christ is your power to obey. And so we're struggling. We have this whole life to live out the, the, the theme of sanctification. We struggle with sin over... Uh, Years we've struggled with it. It has overcome us time and time again. But I suggest to you the reason it has was because we weren't looking at Jesus. Maybe we were, but we really didn't understand who Jesus actually is. And so when you're feeling weak, you look at Jesus and you see his power and how he did all these things for you. And you're like, why would I even sin? And then when you want to say no to God, because I love what I'm doing, I love how it makes me feel, it is in my heart, it is just, and I really enjoy this sinfulness, just look at Jesus. Just look at Jesus, and you will be disarmed. You will be attracted to that Savior on the cross. Just look at what Jesus did. And so what must we do? The meditation, devotional time must be protected. Okay, I'm just going to leave that alone. What, what we ought to do is to just look at Jesus. Just look at Jesus. And the more you look at Jesus, the Bible promises us, and we just looked at the power of God's word, that as we look at Jesus in this beautiful basic instructions before leaving earth, the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible, as one beholds, one becomes changed. That's what the Bible teaches. And if you believe it, please say amen. amen. And if it's your desire to just look at Jesus, I'm not saying to go and... For, I'm, now listen again, I'm not saying... I'm saying look at Jesus. I'm not saying forsake your sins. But when you look at Jesus, you're going to want to forsake your sins. Amen? amen? So if you just want to look at Jesus, kneel down with me and we're going to pray. Father God, 
It's easy to kneel down when an appeal is called. And so, Father, I pray that in our hearts, we would just make that choice just to look at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of God. And your Bible also tells us, if God spared not his own son, then how much more willing is he, uh, uh, then how much more is he willing to freely give us all things whatsoever we ask? And Father, I read in Steps of Christ that whenever we ask something in Jesus' name, Jesus is there showing the merits of his righteousness, his pierced hands and feet, his bruised brow, his pierced side. He's showing that to his Father. And showing that to God so that, not that God can be like, okay, I, I, I see what you did. I like that. Let me go and save them. No, that he can really see that there is value in humanity. And that value is eternal value. And so, Lord, we just want to respond to your call. Why? When, you, when you're in your Bible, you say, Lord, when you say, why should you die? But let us all come unto repentance as we look at the goodness of God. And so, Father, we're just asking that you would be in our hearts today. Work a new thing, not an old thing. Do a new thing. Help us to see your love in a new way. Because we're going to be spending in, in heaven forever with you. And so if we're spending forever in heaven with you, there's a reason why it's just going to be more and joy and newness and every, every single time. So bless us now this Sabbath day. We thank you for the Sabbath that we get to joyfully keep. And we come in Christ's precious name. Amen.